Probably everyone has an early childhood memory of being part of a youth soccer league. Getting up in the morning, putting on the team jersey, two long shorts and socks, cleats, and of course, the all-important shin pads. Most leagues won't let you be on the field without a pair of these on your legs, and if you've ever taken a blow off your shin, you know how much it can hurt. What you may not realize is that the real purpose of the shin guard is not as much to protect your shin bone, but rather the fleshy collection of muscle just lateral to the bone. Forceful blows to this region can be surprisingly serious. We'll explore the reason for this precaution in this lesson on the anterolateral compartments of the leg. Good day, and welcome to another installment of the Gross Anatomy video podcast series. As always, this is Dr. Stuart Engels. Having completed the posterior compartment from the previous lesson, the focus of today's session is the anterior and lateral compartments of the leg, which contain our dorsiflexors and our everter muscles. As usual, we'll look at the muscles in this region and their actions and revisit the neurovascular supply. There's also a couple of important clinical scenarios that we'll need to consider as well. We'll start, as we did last time, with an overview of the leg. Recall that the leg can be divided into three functional compartments by invaginations of the thick crural fascia. This fascia is anchored to the tibia through fusion with the bone's periosteum. We discussed the superficial and deep divisions of the posterior compartment in the previous session. The anterior compartment occupies the space in front of the interosseous membrane and is involved in dorsiflexion and inversion movements. It is separated from the lateral compartment by a thick intermuscular septum. The lateral compartment is involved in eversion and plantar flexion. The thickness of the crural fascia is of clinical significance. It plays an important role in countering blood pooling in the legs by limiting expansion of the compartments. This also increases the effectiveness of the skeletal muscle pump in squeezing in on the veins and milking blood back to the heart. And this becomes a problem with instances of swelling. Since the compartments have a limited room for expansion, swelling leads to increases in pressure instead, which can squeeze on the neurovascular components, which can compromise blood flow and cause neuropathies. The most susceptible is the anterior compartment due to its small size and position. Elevated pressures lead to a condition known as anterior compartment syndrome. And this can be a chronic condition, the result of the accumulation of microtrauma and inflammation from walking or running on hard surfaces, or it can be acute, such as from a forceful impact to the leg that causes a hematoma or a bruise to the muscle. As we'll see, this can lead to a neuropathy to the dorsiflexor muscle group or ischemia in the lower leg, which is considered a medical emergency. The condition can be treated conservatively with price, but in serious acute conditions, a surgical fasciectomy can be performed to release the pressure in the compartment. Time for a closer look at the anterior compartment. Three major muscles and a vestigial fourth muscle make up this group. Most medial is the prominent tibialis anterior muscle. It originates off the upper two-thirds of the lateral border of the tibia and medial margin of the anterior surface of the interosseous membrane. The tendon then runs inframedially, passing anterior to the ankle joint to insert on the medial cuneiform and first metatarsal bones of the foot. Contraction of this muscle dorsiflexes and inverts the ankle. If you produce these two movements yourself, you can easily palpate the tibialis anterior muscles and the thick tendon that protrudes anterior to the medial and lateral malleoli. Lateral to the tibialis anterior is the extensor digitorum longus muscle. It has a pretty extensive origin off three quarters of the anteromedial surface of the fibula, with the uppermost fibers coming off the lateral condyle of the tibia. Four tendons project from the muscle belly, passing anterior to the ankle to insert on the dorsal surface of the middle and distal phalanges of digits two through four. As you would expect from its name, the muscle causes extension of these four digits in addition to its role in dorsiflexion. The third principal muscle of the anterior compartment is the extensor hallucis longus muscle. 
The belly for this muscle is found intermediate and deep to that of tibialis anterior and extensor digitorum, originating off the mid-region of the anterior surface of the interosseous membrane and anteromedial surface of the fibula. The tendon for extensor hallucis longus emerges from between the divergence tendons of tibialis anterior and extensor digitorum longus, projecting to the distal phalanx of the great toe on its dorsal surface. As you might expect, the Latin term for great toe is hallux, which makes this function of the muscle pretty self-explanatory. One final muscle to consider in this group is the fibularis tertius. Bit of an unfortunate nomenclature, since as we will see, it shares its prefix name with the muscles of the lateral compartment. Make no mistake though, this muscle's origin and neurovascular supply is more in line with the anterior compartment muscles, which is why we group it here. A pretty small muscle, originating off the inferior portion of the anterior surface of the fibula, just inferior to the extensor digitorum longus muscle. It projects laterally to insert on the dorsal surface of the base of the fifth metatarsal bone, making it a weak dorsiflexor and everter of the foot. We're going to hold off on talking about the neurovascular supply to the anterior compartment and present the muscles of the lateral compartment at this moment, since both compartments share a common nerve branch. Pretty short list of muscles to discuss, actually, just the two. Fibularis longus is the most superficial of the two muscles. It originates off the superolateral shaft of the fibula, from the neck down through the midshaft. Its tendon then runs inferiorly posterior to the lateral malleolus and curves dramatically around the lateral surface of the cuboid bone to insert on the lateral plantar surface of the medial cuneiform, just lateral to the tibialis anterior insertion point. Contraction therefore produces eversion and plantar flexion of the ankle. It's important to note that while the accepted anatomical term is fibularis longus, this is a pretty recent nomenclature. As with most other structures with the prefix fibularis, this muscle has traditionally been referred to as peroneus longus, and the term is still more commonly used in the clinical setting. As its name implies, fibularis brevis, also commonly known as peroneus brevis, is the shorter of the two muscles. It originates off the lateral surface of the fibula, inferior to the fibularis longus muscle, and runs a short distance deep to the fibularis longus tendon to insert at the base of the fifth metatarsal bone. Similar to fibularis longus, the muscle plantar flexes and everts the ankle. Having covered the muscles of both compartments, we can now discuss the neurovascular supply to the two compartments. Recall from the previous lesson that the popliteal artery passes into the posterior compartment to give off the anterior and posterior arteries. We briefly identified the anterior tibial artery as the branch that passes ventrally between the tibia and fibula, just above the superior border of the interosseous ligament. We can now pick up its course through the anterior compartment, where it provides vascular supply to the muscles of the anterior compartment. From here, the artery continues into the dorsum of the foot, where it is now called the dorsalis pedis artery. Now, at the start of the lecture, we discussed anterior compartment syndrome and the vascular compromise that it may produce. The dorsalis pedis pulse can be palpated in the space between the extensor hallucis longus and extensor digitorum tendons, just past the extensor retinaculum. Bilateral comparison may identify a weakened or absent dorsalis pedis pulse, which may indicate severe vascular compromise, which ultimately may lead to necrosis and amputation if not treated in the earliest phases. Alternatively, the capillary refill test for the nail bed of the great toe may also provide indications of vascular compromise. The lateral compartment does not have its own exclusive blood supply but instead receives numerous perforating branches from the fibular artery that supply the fibularis longus and brevis muscles. We'll finish off this segment with a look at the innervation to the area. Both anterior and lateral compartments are innervated by branches of the common fibular nerve. You should recall from our previous lessons that the common fibular nerve is a lateral component of the sciatic nerve, which passes through the lateral side of the popliteal fossa, wrapping around the neck of the fibula. This is where we pick up its path, as it wraps around the fibula, it pierces the muscles of the lateral compartment. Here, it starts to branch. A series of these branches continue into the anterior compartment, where they are collectively known as the deep fibular nerve. 
This then serves as the motor innervation to the muscles of the anterior compartment. A portion of the deep fibular nerve passes into the dorsum of the foot under the extensor retinaculum. Here, it splits into a lateral motor branch that supplies a small muscle found here and a medial sensory branch that runs with the dorsalis pedis artery, projecting to the webbing of skin between the great and second toe. Another series of branches remain in the lateral compartment and are collectively known as the superficial fibular nerve. These supply motor innervation to the muscles of the lateral compartment. A series of sensory branches will also supply much of the skin over the anterolateral surface of the leg and the dorsum of the foot. The sensory and motor distribution of the superficial and deep fibular nerve branches provide important clues to the location and etiology of a couple of different nerve injuries. We briefly discussed anterior compartment syndrome, which may result from an acute blow and bruising within the anterior compartment or from chronic repetitive microtrauma and inflammation. If the motor supply to the compartment is affected, the person loses the ability to dorsiflex at the ankle. This has important implications in gait. During the swing phase of a step, when the leg is drawn forward, the ankle is held in a slight degree of dorsiflexion to prevent the toes from scraping across the ground. Patients with anterior compartment syndrome tend to trip frequently in the early phases due to this toe drag, and eventually learn to hike the hip of their affected limb up during the swing phase to compensate. Following the swing phase, the heel is normally the first part of the foot to contact the ground, and the anterior compartment contracts eccentrically to control the lowering of the remainder of the plantar surface of the foot. With anterior compartment syndrome, the whole plantar surface of the foot tends to make contact simultaneously. The result is a characteristic gait pattern known as foot drop. Notice that the patient is unable to adequately lift the toes of the right foot during the swing phase, and that it's the toes that make contact with the floor first, followed by the heel. Anterior compartment syndrome is not the only condition that results in foot drop. Because of its superficial positioning as it wraps around the neck of the fibula, the common fibular nerve is also susceptible to injury in this position. The distinction here is that because the damage is further upstream, we would anticipate involvement of the superficial fibular nerve in addition to the deep fibular nerve. This would therefore involve weakness to the muscles of eversion, but more distinctively, we would also anticipate sensory loss over a large portion of the anterolateral leg and dorsum of the foot. With anterior compartment syndrome, the superficial fibular nerve would be spared. Only the small region of skin between the great and second toe, supplied by the deep fibular nerve, would be affected. That's going to do it for this session on the anterolateral compartment of the leg. Up next, we'll complete our journey through the lower limb with a look at the anatomy of the foot. Until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.